we were driving in separate cars. I don't particularly remember why, but I do remember glancing in my rearview mirror far more often than usual just to check to see that Claire, who was my fiance at the time, was still with me, that I hadn't lost her over the course of the drive. And after a particularly uneventful 45 minute drive, when we were finally just a few minutes from Claire's apartment, I checked my mirror one last time, and what I saw about made my heart stop. Some kid in a very nice, very loud, very fast car was zipping around way too quickly on the road, weaving in and out of traffic. And as the noise of his acceleration drew my eyes to the rear view, I saw him pull up next to Claire very quickly and begin to swerve into her lane very quickly while she was still in it. With as fast as he was going and with as hard as he was turning into that lane, I genuinely wondered if I was about to lose the woman that I loved. If Claire hadn't have slammed on the brakes, the accident that followed with the speed that they were going wouldn't have been a fender bender called a tow truck. It would have been police officers and ambulances there. Thankfully, Claire did slam on her brakes. But let me tell you, I'm a human being just like all of you. I know it's shocking. And I get annoyed on the road from time to time, but more often than not, I drive like a grandmother. And so what came next came as a surprise, even to me. When I saw this kid with his fancy car almost take out the woman I was about to marry, for me, in that moment, what I experienced on the road wasn't just annoyance or frustration. What I felt in that moment was outrage. And in turn, I behaved outrageously. I'm really not at all proud of this. But as this kid passed my wife and pulled up closer to me, continuing to do his weaving in and out of traffic thing as I'm watching him, as he begins accelerating very quickly by me, I accelerated with him. I blocked him. And when he slowed down, I slowed down too. I stayed next to this kid, preventing the weave in and out over and over and over again until we were both stuck behind a very slow car because I wasn't moving to let him get around the guy. And it's the craziest thing. But it wasn't until I glanced in my rearview mirror again and I saw all of the people stuck behind us that I came to my senses. I was doing exactly what was upsetting me. This kid had put everybody else in the road and the woman that I loved in danger. And here I was driving just as recklessly. And so the moment I realized what I was doing, the moment I came to my senses, I, I knocked it off. I let the kid go by. But the craziest thing of all of this was I was definitely in the wrong. But even though what I was doing was definitely wrong, because of what had been done to somebody that I loved, I really felt like I was in the right. Like I was doing something good and noble. But meanwhile, to everybody else on the road, chances are they didn't see what happened between that guy and Claire. They just saw what I was doing to that guy. Rather than them looking at that guy and seeing the maniac, they looked at me and saw the person endangering them. Because of my outrage, I behaved outrageously. But it felt completely normal, completely acceptable, and completely okay. And the more and more I think about this story in my life, the more and more I wonder if this isn't exactly why we live in such a conflict-prone society, if this isn't why we're caught in the midst of this culture war that we're in, in our society, there is what I would call an epidemic of outrage. You see, what happens is we feel this sense of outrage, this feeling of righteous anger, 
The person in the car behind me performed an injustice to somebody that I cared about. And because the anger that I feel is is righteous, I tend to respond from it. But when I respond from righteous anger, I run a real risk of responding unrighteously because the value, the motivation behind my response is good. I justify doing what is not. It doesn't help any of us that almost all of our cultural inputs, most of the things we have feeding into our lives are things designed to spark outrage. Things that are designed to get a rise out of us, whether it's people from our perspective trying to provoke us to action or people from the other perspective trying to provoke us past reason. Outrage is a defining tone within our culture. And people who are experiencing a sense of outrage tend to behave outrageously. And when I am confronted with other people's outrageous behavior, I tend to feel outrage. It is this vicious cycle. And I can't help but wonder if it's the reason that it feels like we're always in a fight, that we're always past the point of talking. It's because we're speaking from outrage rather than reason. So there's this concept. It's known as fighting words, right? Them's fighting words. You see it in the movies and things like that. And the idea behind it is that you don't have to throw a punch in order to start a fight. There are words and phrases that can provoke a person that can spark an outrage that can lead some of the most level headed people into some of the most outrageous behavior. If somebody speaks about the right person in your family or calls out that one thing that's secretly your deepest held insecurity, it can cause us or others to fight back. And even though a punch was not thrown, a fight has begun. This person said this thing about my family, my people, my tribe, or my most deeply rooted insecurity, them's fighting words. And before I know it, I'm throwing around fighting words like a ping pong ball. They're bouncing everywhere. And because of my outrage, even though what I'm doing is wrong, it feels like I am in the right. But when I behave from outrage, people don't tend to see the car behind me and what that person did to provoke the fight. Right? They see me and my outrageous behavior. And if my witness to the world, if my testimony is a story of outrage, not only am I in a dangerous place spiritually, but I'm also giving people a good reason not to want to know the faith that I proclaim. And with that, if you have your Bibles with, would you please turn with me to Matthew 5, verses 21 through 26. Again, that is Matthew 5, 21 through 26. We'll be bringing it up on the screens as well. So for the last month, we've been going through this series, Rules for Fair Fighting. And we've been talking about how we as Christians should navigate conflict and how we should live out our faith in the midst of it. And week one, we talked about the reason for a fight. And we learned that when we fight, we fight for unity We are fighting for each other, for our brother and sister to be reconciled with us. Week two, we discuss the rounds of a fight and we discuss what and when we should bring others in or if we ever should at all. And last week we had a brief hiatus and a phenomenal message from our district superintendent, Joey, who spoke on unity. seems like God has a theme for our church right now, doesn't it? I didn't ask him to do that. This week, We're going to be pressing into these ideas of outrage and fighting words. We're going to do so by looking at the words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 through 26, which reads, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Racha, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. 
Therefore, if you are offering your, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown in prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. This passage could easily be split into two parts. There are two big ideas that draw from each other. If the first part is true, that must necessarily lead to the second part. And if I were to label part one of the passage, I would call it fighting words. Verse 22, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable in court, and anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So this word, Raka, it's really fun to say. It's like I'm coughing in Russian. Raka. Yeah, give me a Raka, would you? Give me a Raka. Ah, oh, that was so good. It sounded so gross. You guys are awesome. This word, Raka, was a word meaning simply empty-headed. It was, at best, a grade school level insult. But this was something that meant so much more in their time and culture. To the people of Israel, a name meant everything. It was the source and seat of your identity. This is why when you read the Old Testament, there's so often a description or a meaning attached to the naming of a child. Because that meaning was a blessing or a fact spoken over this person's identity. And for them to call a person Racha was to deny them the dignity of their name and to speak over them a false identity, to call them an empty head rather than who they were. And honestly, I think that the same is much more true of us than we might like to acknowledge. Words matter. God spoke the earth into existence by his word. And we who are made in the image of God carry far more power in our words than we realize. We can speak light and life into people. Or we can speak hurt and pain. Jason was the smartest person in our friend group, which is saying a lot because we were all nerds. We treated GPAs and test grades like they were a competition. And more often than not, if they were a competition, Jason would have been the winner. He was absolutely brilliant. One day at the end of a semester in college, while we were all sitting at our desks in church history class, Jason asked the most bizarre question, something none of us understood. Have you guys filled out your adias yet? He asked us. Many of you ever heard of an adaya? I still haven't. It's, I had no idea what he was talking about. And after a brief moment of silence where everybody looked at him with that tilted head, like, huh? Kind of vibe. Jason responded, you know, the, the adaya, the survey. At this point, I'm beginning to question, is this like the Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram? Is this a personality profile? And after another few moments of awkward silence, Jason at this point, with clear frustration in his voice, said, Via Daya, the survey they send out at the end of every single semester. And that was when it clicked. Every semester, at the end of the semester, the school sent out a survey for every class to rate the class and the professor, and usually extra credit came with it. And that survey was called the IDEA. The IDEA survey, spelled exactly like you would expect it to be spelled. It hit every one of us at the exact same time, and that awkward silence turned to outrageous laughter. Jason, the smartest person in our friend group, the guy with the highest GPA and the best test scores, 
was just very confidently mispronouncing the word idea. And from that point forward, we would not let him live it down. Poor Jason, for as smart as he was, there were just a few words that he had a really difficult time with. And every time he had a difficult time with a word, he would still very confidently mispronounce it and we'd all have a good laugh. And at the end of the semester, from that point forward, we would all make a joke of it. Anybody fill out the Adaya survey yet? <laughs> Do you guys hear we get extra credit if we fill out this Adaya? <laughs> we all thought we were stinking hilarious. And it wasn't until Jason's wife pulled us aside that we realized every one of us was laughing except for one. And that we weren't laughing with Jason. We were laughing at him. What we thought was all in good fun was in all reality speaking a false identity over our friend. And this person that we loved deeply, that should have been defined by his brilliance, we led him to believe that he was a fool. While Jason never started a fight about it, we were definitely provoking one. What to us was intended as a simple joke was in all reality fighting words because we were provoking and capitalizing on the insecurity of a friend. In my head, when we were confronted about it, immediately my, I went to, he needs to be less sensitive about this. But in all reality, as his Christian brother, for me to have behaved with grace wasn't for him to be less sensitive. It was for me to be less insensitive. And hear me when I say, I'm not saying we need to end all manner of playfulness with all people. But this passage is telling us we need to be very careful about the words that we choose to use. And especially if those are words spoken in anger and outrage. Because if words said in good fun among people who know we love them are still words that can deeply wound how much more so when it's said from a place of outrage? Even if it's not the intent, when we behave like this, we're likely either picking or perpetuating a fight. And what this passage is telling us is that as Christians, we should not be using fighting words. The words that we use should be ones that are a good witness to the world around us. And if fighting words are our default mode, chances are we're in a dangerous place spiritually. So I'm going to take just a second and I'm going to be completely honest with us. And what I'm about to say isn't something I'm trying to poke the bear, but speak a truth. One of the primary places that I see fighting words from the church all over, from most of the churches I've been in, is the way we speak and post politically on Facebook. And one of the primary places and I've, I've wrestled with this. And honestly, I think it's so widespread that I need to say it from the pulpit. This isn't about politics or about a politician. It's about how we're representing ourselves in Christ. I don't think there's a place in the church for this phrase, let's go, Brandon. I see it all the time. And I'm not a political person as much as any of you might think I am. Straight up, I dislike all politicians. I think they're all slimy. Unless you're a politician, then I think you're great. You're the best politician of all time. But if you don't know the origins or true meaning behind this, I'm not going to go into details. And I would even encourage you not to look it up. But it's saying a really harsh thing about a person made in the image of God. This is something, if you said it about my wife, if somebody said this about my mother, if somebody said this about my best friend, these would be fighting words. And I'm going to say, if a whole lot of people in the church were saying this toward any individual at all, if this was a phrase that was directed at Sylvester Stallone, the greatest thespian of our era, if this was a phrase that was directed towards Frank Sinatra with his kind of creepy crooning voice, or let's say this was a phrase that was directed toward the other side of the political spectrum and somebody said it of Donald Trump, I would stand up here and I would say this exact same thing. If our witness to the world 
is a regular proclamation of let's go Brandon rather than Jesus saves. The world isn't the one in the wrong. If people won't know more about who we are against than who we are for, we need to rethink the way that we use our words. Because when we speak words like this, it will spark an outrage from people who don't agree with us. And that is one barrier that the gospel doesn't need to be built in front of others. We don't have to agree on everything. We can voice our disagreement, but in our anger, may we not sin against one another or anybody else. May our words reflect the Christ that we preach. And yes, Christ did use some harsh words from time to time. But more often than not, they were directed towards people just like us, the religious folk, rather than the people outside of the church. Fighting words are not our words. That's the first point of the passage, which leads to the second. Because fighting words are not our words, And because we're flawed human beings corrupted by sin, who are almost certainly going to behave outrageously from time to time, one of the best things that we can do in this world is to own our own garbage, to confess our mess, and to ask forgiveness in the moments when we're out of line. To focus a little bit less on the offenses made against us, and a little bit more on the offenses we've made. Verses 23 through 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then, come and offer your gift. One of the best things that we can do is to focus a little bit less on the punches that we've taken or even the punches we could throw in response and to focus a little bit more on the punches that we've probably already thrown. Because at the end of the day, no matter how much I might want to, I cannot control what another person does, how they behave, think, or respond. Even God chose to give us free will. Can can you imagine that? That's like a lot of love. He gave me free will. I am such an idiot sometimes. I can't decide for others what they will do or say. And they can't make that decision for me. Their actions do not dictate my behavior. Only I can choose how I'm going to respond to the world around me. To do so following the way of Christ or to do so following the way of the world and my flesh. So long as our focus is on the outrage, so long as our focus is on the anger, we will almost certainly respond out of anger. But if we instead flip the script and focus on the outrage that we may cause, the way that we may have contributed or even provoked a fight, we may then start to be the change that we're looking in the world for in the world by living into that change ourselves. If all that we ever do is participate in the culture war, the war will never end. But if we, rather than approach the world as a combatant, approach it with the heart and mind of Christ, if we speak with his kindness and grace when we speak, including in the moments when we're speaking hard truths, we will speak in a way where we're far more likely to be heard rather than provoke the outrage that deafens. And for us, even if it feels like we're opening ourselves to attack by owning our own, by going and apologizing for the wrongs that we've done, I sincerely can't think of a single time in my life where I've apologized to somebody where it went poorly. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I sound like a sketch bag this whole sermon. Yeah, there was that time I drove recklessly on the road. Uh, There was that time I mocked my friend until he wanted to cry. I couldn't preach this this message unhypocritically if I didn't go and make some apologies this week. I hate making apologies. God help me. I'm a prideful man. I don't want to look weak. I don't want to look wrong. 
every single apology I made led not only to reconciliation, but to apologies from the other person as well. When we present ourselves in a healthy manner, right? Unhealth breeds unhealth. Cancer spreads. Health leads to health. And when we speak good and kind things to others, more often than not, what we receive is good and kind things. And in the moments when we don't, may one person not corrupt our image of the rest of the world around us. Because for as much as we're all corrupted by sin, each of us is made in the image of God. And each of us has a chance to reflect that, and most people probably will. We will screw up. We will spark conflict from time to time because we're human. And usually the best thing that we can do is to own it, to apologize. And even if we feel like the other party is the one that is apologize, should be apologizing, to move on to a healthier conversation. Our final rule for fair fighting, stop the fight, start a conversation. And as the band comes forward and as we move into a time of response, that is our challenge for the week. <laughs> I, I'm so sorry for the parents in the room. I know how difficult this is. You're doing a great job. You really, really are. Our challenge for the week is to do an outrage detox. Because insofar as I'm focused on the outrage, I will behave outrageously. And so for, for each of us, the challenge is to cut out some of those things that lead us to outrage for a week, right? For some of us, that might be turning off cable news. Cable news almost always speaks in such a way as to provoke us. I'm going to be honest, this is going to be a hard one for me. I'm just going to shut off Facebook for a week. It's those memes that really get me, man. People provoke me and I want to be a keyboard warrior. Turn off the things that outrage us. And then the harder one. If you can think of something you've done to outrage another. If you can think of people in your life that you might owe an apology to. And this isn't intended as a disrespect to any of you. Chances are you, have, you owe somebody an apology. I, I had a guy last night sitting in the back row, walked up at the end of service. He said to me, I'm just going to preemptively apologize because we both know I'm going to give you a hard time for a long time. To go and own your own with anybody that might have taken offense to you, to leave your gift at the altar, to go and apologize and then bring it back. Because sometimes our worship is reconciliation in Jesus' name. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you are and all that you do for us. God, I thank you that your grace was for me even when I was and even when I do spark an outrage within your own heart. We thank you for the Christ who died for us while we were still sinners. And God, I thank Thank you right now for the life that I see in this church. God, for the joy that there is to look around and, and see children in a place. In the same space where we see some of our more seasoned veterans, some of our whiter hairs. God, I thank you for the beauty that is the unity within this church. And I pray that your spirit would be with us to promote that, to continue that. And to represent that so well in the world that people would see something different that they crave and want to step foot in this place. That our words would not create a divide, but create bridges. God, I thank you for these brothers and sisters who I'm so happy to see again after so long away. I pray that you would bless each of them and speak words of life over them. In Jesus' name.